Hi to everyone. My name is Anna Grichishkina, and I'm a journalist for the International Coaching News, the largest in the world coaching publication. I'm also a full-time traveler on a motorcycle, and that's how I met by lucky coincidence three years ago my today's guest, who am I, I am delighted to introduce, Gerard O'Donovan. <laughs> Lovely to be here, Anna. Um, Thank you, Gerard, for joining. Uh, I don't think that there are many people in the coaching world who don't know or didn't hear about Gerard. Uh, Gerard is the founder and CEO of the Noble Manhattan Group, the longest established professional coaching and coach training organization in Europe. Also, he's the founder and CEO of the Coach Radio International, the founder and CEO of the Alpha Group, the leading group to help owners of small and medium-sized enterprises non-executive director and past president of the International Institute of Coaching and Mentoring, and much, much more. Gerard, welcome and thank you so much for your time and for your willingness to share with us some of your experience. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Gerard, I would like to go back in time a little bit. Uh, it was the summer of 2018. I was traveling on my motorcycle in Bulgaria and you were doing the same. Yes. And at some point, our paths miraculously crossed at one motorcycle event in a, a very lovely area in Bulgaria at the place called Motocamp. And that's how and uh, where my acquaintance with you and with life coaching started. And at that time, I was inspired to become a student of the Noble Manhattan Group. At the beginning, I said that it was a lucky coincidence, but honestly, I don't think so. I, I'm sure that it was meant to be because I've always been interested in personal development and in helping people. And uh, with our meeting and with life coaching, it looks like just the stars aligned. So uh, what about your history of becoming a coach? It looks like it was also kind of a lucky coincidence. It, it not, was, it, not, not something that was planned or dreamed of before. <laughs> no, it was an absolute accident, uh, absolute accident. Um, and. Um, in fact, I remember when we first met in that beautiful motor camp and I saw you stand up in front of a crowd and give a magnificent talk about your adventures, your travels, your experience. Um, and that was my first uh, meeting with you. So it was, it was wonderful. Um, coaching, the way I got into it was an accident, not planned. I, 20 years ago, I was running um, over 20 years, 1995. I was running a personal development business, quite small, uh, running it from my home called Noble Manhattan Personal Development. I had one member of staff, a secretary, and I was running courses on attitude, power of the mind, self-esteem, goal planning, presentation skills, that type of thing. And we, there was a show in London called The Vitality Show, a three-day show at a place called Olympia, a big exhibition centre. And I paid for a stand, an exhibition booth at that show. And on the second day, my secretary and I, a lovely lady called Stacy, Stacy Melvin, we were manning it. We had done it all day one, all day two. And I got a bit bored and I said to her, look, I'm going for a coffee for an hour. You look after the stand. And Olympia is huge on different levels, hundreds of exhibition stalls. And I was walking along a wall with a coffee and a fire door opened right in front of me. And there was a lecture room and someone had just come out of the lecture room uh, using the back door. And I could hear an American voice talking. So I slipped in and I stood in the back in the dark. And I listened to this extraordinary lady called Laura Berman Fortgang a coach from New York and she had come over to the UK and she was talking about this strange weird new thing called life coaching which I hadn't heard of before and I waited and waited and uh, about an hour she finished and then people went up and congratulated her and I waited and waited and waited and at the very end when she was on her own I went up and spoke to her I took her business card um, and then that started the process. I ended up doing three different courses over the next year with American companies because there was nothing in the United Kingdom. And then that was 95 to 96. And then 96, I started to coach. 
and um, it was very pioneering because no one had heard of coaching back then mm -hmm. and when you'd say to people I'm a coach they would either think you meant football coach or they used to say things like oh they used to think autobus you know how, how much is a, a ticket from London to Manchester and, and this type of question so it was very pioneering um, and we had to educate people before I could even dream of asking them to, to pay money uh, for it. So I coached and coached and coached almost every day for three years, up to 1999. Um, you know, learning my trade, learning my skill, doing my apprenticeship. Um, and then in 1999, having done it for three years, um, I then started to train coaches. So, so that's how it began. Oh, I love this kind of stories about accidents or coincidences, which is not actually an accident. But for me, it's always, it's like a meant to be. It's like coaching drives the, the correct people into its area. Um, but I'm just wondering, coaching is a very young profession, just a few decades. Yes. So why, why did it appear exactly at this period of time? Why well, not a few centuries before, but just a few decades before? That is a good question. And, and my answer may not make sense to everyone, but I believe that the universe creates what it needs at different periods of time. And I believe that coaching is something that the world needs right now. And it has come along at a time when it is most required. The world is going through incredible changes. It has gone through incredible changes in the last two decades. Um, everything is quickening up. There is a velocity out there. There is an interdependence. And when something like uh, coronavirus comes along, it's like a spider's web. It affects everything. Um, and at times like these, coaching is, I'll use the expression, worth its weight in gold. Um, yeah. it, it is there to heal, to help. Um, in so many ways. So I believe that it is something whose time has come because it was needed. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I kept my next question actually for, uh, for the end of our interview, but I would like to ask it now. So in this time of uh, coronavirus pandemic, so what is our role as coaches? What can be our contribution to the world in these difficult times? Well, coaching, all right. Coaching has the, the power, the ability to make a profound and lasting change in a person's life. And it's a change for the good. It's never, ever a change for the bad. If we look at the world, there are two competing elements, uh, and I call them force versus power. I took that from a wonderful man called David Hawkins, a wonderful clinical uh, uh, scientist many years ago. And for generations, for thousands of years, there has been force versus power, yin and yang, good and bad, light and dark. There always have been these two competing elements. In fact, there has to be, because you cannot appreciate one if you have not experienced the other. So you cannot appreciate the, the light if you have not experienced the dark. So coaching falls on the side of power. It's to do with empowering people. It gives people back their own power. So, and, it, and by doing that, it gives them the strength and the courage to follow their true values. Today, we live in a world where we are assaulted daily, television, radio, shops, social media, by other people's values, telling us what we should do, what we should think, what we should buy, what we should set our goals for, and we become confused. And it leads to many types of mental problems, emotional problems, physical problems. Coaching helps us to reset and go back to our true core values. And when, that, when, when a coach works with a client and helps that one individual to do that, and to become who they truly are, 
they become then, it, it's like a radiator. It radiates heat out to the people close to them and it has a knock on effect. So by the very nature of someone being who they are, it affects again in a positive way, it impacts in a positive way and em empowers the people around them and then the people around them. And it's like throwing a stone into a pool, the ripples go in all directions. So coaching has the ability to change individuals, to change therefore families, to change therefore communities, to change therefore groups, and maybe even change whole, whole countries in the way that people think and act and behave. Yeah, that's a huge responsibility on the shoulders of, uh, of coaches. And definitely, even though the coaching is a young profession, but there are quite a few reliable training company schools that provide the proper training with the professional diploma, etc. Uh, but I'm wondering if anyone can become a coach, even if they get a proper education, or are there some inequalities and talents are required? How do you understand that you fit into this profession? Yeah, that is a great question. And in the early days when I started, I was of the impression, and because I was training coaches and your ego gets in the way and all of that, I was under the impression that yes, we can train anyone to be a good coach. I've realized that that is not the case. You can teach people techniques, methods, models, coaching scenarios. You can teach them how to use tools, questioning skills, listening skills, values, ethics, beliefs, self-esteem, dealing with abundance, dealing with rapport, goal planning, goal setting, and, and 20 other subjects. You can teach that. But the key thing that people need, they need in here to really love people. They need to really, really like and love working with people and if they don't have that within them they're never going to be a great coach they might be an okay coach because they can apply methods and processes but they're never going to be a great coach because there is one thing that coaches need that that will set them above you know the great from the not so great coaches Coaches need to have a true compassion for the people they're working with. Yeah. So com compassion is everything. So you, and you can't have compassion if you don't love people. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, so obviously the people aspiring to become a coaches, uh, they, they are drawn by the desire to help people. They love people. They feel compassionate about people and they're willing to make a difference in the world. Yes. Uh, but still, I'm sure that many coaches would like to uh, to fully dedicate their time to the coaching and to make it their full time dedication uh, with some stable income, you know, not to be worried sure. about money, not to be uh, pulled between different jobs just to sustain themselves financially. Mm -hmm. But according to the statistics that I came across quite a few times that only a very small percentage of coaching businesses survive the two year threshold. Most of them, they just go down, unfortunately. So you're not just an amazing coach, but also a successful businessman. What, how would you comment on that? Uh, what is the reason of most of coaching businesses not being successful? Okay. And what would you recommend to new coaches? How to avoid some pitfalls? That is such an important question. And it's the figures you gave are not only relevant to the coaching industry. It's all entrepreneurs right across the board, every country, every continent, every culture, every language, something like at the end of five years, less than 20% of all new businesses are still alive, still going. So a very small percentage. Now, again, we could come to a thing called Pareto's law, Alfredo Pareto, 1890 in Italy. He talked about the 80-20 rule, so that's relevant here. But the reason is this, and how can I explain? You have, if I do it this way, title, proposition, and your business. Most people in business don't understand the difference, and would, would you be okay if I took two minutes to explain of this? Of course, of course. Yeah. 
when you ask people what do they do, they will tell you, I am an electrician, I am a web designer, I am a management consultant, I manufacture shoes, whatever. That's your title, that's what you do, you know? That's not what customers want to hear. So people will usually tell you their title. Most businesses in the world do not have a compelling proposition. And this is crucial. To be successful, you have to have a compelling proposition. And I'm going to give you two examples. Uh, I'll pick two worldwide companies that most people listening to this might, might, might have come across. Here is one. And their compelling proposition is three little sentences. It's hot, fresh pizza delivered to your door in 30 minutes or your money back. Now, for the people who don't know, that's a company called Domino's. Domino's are relatively new to the pizza world in, in the great scheme of things. Well before them, there were giants, one called Pizza Express, one called Pizza Hut. These were the leaders in their field. Worldwide, every big city, uh, they were multi-million dollar businesses. So suddenly, out of nowhere, Domino's came and went shooting up to take the top position. And it was because of their compelling Watch proposition, face. right? If you think about it, hot, hot fresh pizza delivered to your door in 30 minutes or your money back. Do they talk about quality? No, they don't. Do they talk about price? No, they don't. You know, are they the cheapest in the market? No, they're not. Are, are their pizza the best quality? Well, arguably, maybe yes, maybe no. They don't talk about that. They talk about hot, fresh pizza, which builds up a picture in your mind immediately. Deliver to your door in 30 minutes, very clear, very specific, or your money back. We call this a compelling proposition. So the next one is, uh, the company's proposition is, when it absolutely, positively has to be there overnight. When it absolutely, positively has to be there overnight. That's a company called FedEx, a big worldwide courier company. Now, do they talk about price? No. Are they the cheapest? Absolutely not. But here's the thing. You, if you are a logistics manager in a company in London and you have an office in Istanbul and you need to get them some sort of an engineering part quickly for one of their big machines, who do you absolutely know will get it there by tomorrow? FedEx. And even if you go to them and you say, ah, yes, but I have a parcel, it's this big. Will you take that? The answer is yes. Oh, but it weighs a thousand pound in weight. Yes. Ah, but I need to get something to Anchorage in Alaska or Baghdad. Yes. There is no question when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. What a compelling proposition. Most businesses, when you say to them, what do you do? They simply tell you their title. I'm a management consultant. I design websites. I make shoes. They do not come back with a compelling proposition. And that is one of their reasons why they don't progress and get more customers. The third reason is most businesses don't understand the business they're in. So if you are a management consultant, what is your job? And they will tell you to do management consulting. And that's wrong. That's not your business. Your business is to sell your product or service. If you make shoes, what is your business? Your product is the shoes. What is your business? Your business is to sell and market shoes. If you're a coach, what do you do? What you do as coach, what's your business? Your business is to sell coaching. And many people don't look at it that way, Anna. The, the old saying, if you build it, they will come, unfortunately, is not true. And there are two types of coaches in the world, the good 
and the successful. What is frustrating to me is that the good are not always successful. And what is quite annoying is that the successful are not always good. Exactly. What they are good at is marketing themselves. It does not mean they are a good coach. So to be a good and successful coach, you need two separate skills. One is coaching, of course, or understanding the coaching method, models, techniques, abilities, and have the right emotions and compassion to go with it. But as well as that, you need another set of skills, how to market and sell your product and service. And a lot of people, they don't like to think of themselves as a salesperson. And sometimes, sometimes yeah. they don't have a proper skills for that. What to do in this no, situation? <laughs> that's true. Or they don't know where to go and how to get this knowledge and this ability and who can teach them and, and, and so on. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Thank you so much and wonderful examples of the compelling propositions from some of the businesses. But what uh, what can be the example of the coaching compelling proposition? Because this is something intangible, right? And uh, can actually the niching be an option in this situation? It can. Now, there are, and it's probably more, we have a research division and we've researched that as I speak to you now, there are 54 different types of coaching, 54. So once you are qualified, and you don't need any extra training, it's a marketing thing, but you could market yourself as a health coach, a wealth coach, a relationship coach, a career coach, a goal coach, a wedding coach, a divorce coach, a sex coach, a confidence coach, a cross-cultural coach. There's so many. Statistics show that people who niche actually make a bit more money. Okay, so that's Let's put that to one side. And one of the reasons is they know exactly who their market is. They're not using a machine gun to just tell everyone. They're targeting their marketing specifically. If you are a relationship coach, a wedding coach, a divorce coach, you know, you know who you are aiming at. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can be very clear, very precise with your marketing, your message, and so on. Um, so on the one hand, evidence does seem to show that people who niche make a little bit more money. Mm -hmm. okay. Personally, I don't niche, I never have. Um, I love the variety of coaching men and women in all different walks of life, in all different positions, on all different topics. I find that hugely gratifying. When I started in coaching a long time ago, one of the, uh, I got lots of bits of advice from many different people. I got one bit of advice from a wonderful man called Thomas Leonard. We call him the father of coaching. He was one of the people in the 80s, 1980s, who, who coined the phrase life coaching. And I was talking to him once. We were, he was running a workshop and afterwards I had a coffee with him. And I said, you know, we talked about this and he said, Gerard, I'll give you one piece of advice. He said, coach anything that moves. And that was his advice. Coach anything and everything that moves. And the, the message behind that was like an apprentice, get as much practice under your belt as you can. Coach anything and everything on anything that you can in the early days. Don't consider niching at the beginning. Okay. Get as much practice as you can and then go with your heart. And if your heart is pulling you in a particular direction, and I have two types of coaching that I really do love to do. And if I could, I would do more of those, but, but I don't limit myself. One is I love what I call spiritual coaching, helping people to find uh, their meaning in life. Mm -hmm. um, but the other type of coaching I love is coaching owners of small businesses. SM, because I am the owner of a business and I mm -hmm. know what it's like to wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning, worried sick, worried to death about a problem you have to deal with in the morning and not wanting the morning to come. You know, 
but it's coming and you have to deal with it and you have no one to turn to. So I know what it's like to feel like that. So I do love coaching business owners and people who are looking for a meaning and a direction in life. Uh, I call that spiritual coaching. That, that might not be the right way of defining it. But so my advice is in the first year or two of your career, mm -hmm. coach anything, coach everything, and then go with your heart. So yes, as I say, just go with your heart. Yeah, thank you so much, because that was the question that I was really curious about, especially that uh, maybe after a couple of months, I will get my diploma. And that was my question, what should I do? How I will proceed? Being just a general coach, or should I immediately start thinking about my niche, but then what niche to choose? Uh, so my question is, if the time comes when, uh, when we want to choose a niche, uh, do we have to be uh, absolute experts in that niche? Or how does it go? How to choose this niche? Oh, the good, new the good news is no, absolutely not. Um, you see, the coaching is very different from counselling, therapy yeah. and consulting. In the world of consulting, management consultants usually specialise in an area. They, they build up uh, expertise. Uh, they are a consultant in the shipping industry, the retail industry, the engineering industry, the insurance and banking industry, and so on. Because those industries have their own ways of doing things. As a coach, it is so gratifying that we can coach anyone on anything because the rule is we do not have to be knowledgeable of that area or that industry. In fact, it can be a little bit counterproductive if we are, because we want to then, mm. the, the, the number one rule in coaching is that coaches have no answer. Whereas mm -hmm. if you are an expert in a particular industry and you are coaching someone who has a problem in that industry, there is a huge temptation to just try and give them what you think is an answer. Okay. And it may not be. So coaching is, is relieving, it's, it frees you up because there is no pressure on you to come up with an answer. Yeah, thank you so much. Gerard, coming back to the proposition of the uh, training services, as we talked, there are so many schools now and training companies, uh, many of them which are very reliable and yeah. obviously Noble Manhattan Group is one of those. But the market is getting more and more flooded with other propositions, so to say. Just the other day, I came across one advertisement on Facebook, which made me really annoying. Uh, in one day masterclass, uh, people are offered training in coaching. And at the end of the day, one day, one full day, they get professional diploma. I was really annoyed with that, you know? Fantastic. So, <laughs> moreover, there is so much confusion in terms and definitions, boundaries between coaching and other disciplines. So how not to get lost in this jungle and how to stand out and actually how to convince the potential clients where they can find the true value for their money? Sure. So that, that's a, a wide question and I'll give a couple of answers. There are indeed like any industry that grows, and we've seen this in countless other industries, by the way, the communications industry, the telecommunications industry, the energy industry, when they grow or they start in their first decade or two, you get lots and lots and lots of uh, companies or individuals jumping into the market, setting up their companies. But as an industry matures and sets its standards and criteria and qualifications, most of those, fly, I'll call them fly-by-night companies, exit. They can't cope. It takes money, effort, energy, commitment, resources to set up a really good professional training organization to train and support individuals. You'll see this from the world of universities and so on. So the coaching industry is still relatively new, just a few decades. So there are indeed lots of fly-by-night organizations jumping in with all sorts of offers that sound very attractive. Um, but the good news is there are a number of what we would call 
worldwide accreditation and standards bodies who have stuck a pole, a flag in the sand and said, we are here to uphold the standards of this industry. And I'll give you the names of two or three of them. These organizations, they are not training organizations. They are accreditation bodies. So they accredit two things. They accredit coach training organizations, coach training schools, mm -hmm. and they also accredit individuals like you and I. We can go to them and get professional accreditation. And the world of coaching has a, a rank structure. And there are three or four, I guess, accepted levels. Now, the organizations use different language. Some use practitioner coach, senior coach, master coach, and fellow. Some use a number, level three, level five, level seven, and so on. And uh, one called the ICF, very good, uses ACC, PCC, master. But they're all pretty much the same criteria needed. So any client who hires a coach, as long as they do their due diligence, like as they should, and they make sure that they find out if their coach as an individual is accredited by one of these worldwide bodies at a particular level, and that they trained with an organization that also is accredited at a particular level, then they are safe that they are, and they are taking the services of a true professional, you know? Um, and they should do their due diligence, not just look at someone's LinkedIn profile, because what will someone say about themselves? They'll say they're great. Not just, not just look at their website, because everyone on their own website tells the world that they're great. They should look at their qualifications. Where do they get their training from? Where do they get their accreditation from? And what level is it? So here's a few of the organizations that are good and standard bearers. There's uh, one called the IAPCNN, International Authority for Professional Coaching and Mentoring. They're in about 120 countries. There's the ICF, International Coaching Federation. Again, very well established, been well over 100 countries. The Institute of Leadership and Management. Now that's a government backed organization. Then there's the um, ILM or, or Institute of the ILM City and Guilds, a different one. So there's the Institute of Leadership and Management, and then there's the Institute City and Guilds, two completely separate organizations, very high standards, one of the highest in the world. There's the EMCC, European Mentoring and Coaching Council. And then there's a, I'll give one more, a, a top regulator, IRCM, International Regulator for Coaching and Mentoring. That was actually appointed by the UK government and now is in about 100 countries. So these are well-established, good organizations with the right ethics and good quality standards. Okay. So we should not be worried about those uh, companies that will disappear overnight, right? And the no. right client will find the right coach. They will. It, and it's the nature of things. Companies spring up, they go, they spring up, they go, you know, as an industry grows and matures. And, and you get consolidation then. Yeah. But still, there are getting more and more coaches on the market. Does the world need actually uh, more coaches? And I know that uh, Noble Manhattan Company has uh, quite an ambitious plans on how many students they want to train, right? So how to survive in this competition? Okay, so it depends how you look at this. How many coaches are there in the world today? Well, difficult to get an absolute number, but there are two organizations that do a worldwide survey. One is called PwC, Price Waterhouse Coopers, a big accounting and consulting firm. They do an annual, very, very in-depth audit of the coaching world. The other is Sherpa Consulting, big American organization. And you can go to both of their websites and download their PDF uh, surveys. Uh, very, uh, the, the PwC is a 150 page survey. It shows all the types of coaching, how much money coaches make, how many there are, and so on. So how many coaches are there? 
about, about 400,000 coaches worldwide, between 400, 450,000. So is that a lot or is that a little? Well, in the United Kingdom, there are over 400,000 registered therapists and consultants in that industry. You know, yeah. gestalt, transactional analysis, occupational therapy, and, and so on. In America, there are 1.2 million registered therapists and consultants. So in the whole world, there are 400 to 450,000 coaches. So when you look at it that way, actually, it's not an awful lot. Then we come to the sad figure that even though there are over 400,000 coaches, the majority of them are not very good at building their business. And I wish that were not the case, but therefore they are not real competition. Mm -hmm. So the amount that is very good, you know, 20% are very good at building their business. Another 20% are quite good. And the top 20% make an absolute fortune, absolute fortune. And uh, the next 20% make a very, very good living. The next 20% are doing it part time. They're already doing counseling, therapy, training, management, consulting and coaching as well. And then the, the, the bottom 40 don't do very well and they don't stay in the industry for long. They come, they train, they try and build their business, but they don't use the right methods and techniques. And two, three years later, they're no longer in the industry. So it's yeah. pretty sad, but you get top 20% make a fortune. And I mean, for charging hundreds and thousands per hour, the next 20% make a wonderful living. They're doing it full time. The next 20% are doing it as well as another occupation. And then the bottom 40 don't do too well. Yeah. So it said that uh, actually most of the coaches, they don't, uh, they don't have those skills, those marketing skills or sales skills to promote themselves. Un unfortunately, unfortunately. Is there anything that Noble Manhattan Group doing to support the new coaches after they get their professional diplomas? Yes, we do. And, and this isn't a, a sales pitch, but we, Noble Manhattan is a little bit like the mafia. You can join, but you can never leave. You know, <laughs> you can never leave the family. Um, but I mean that in a nice way. When we train people, we then carry on supporting them for the rest of their life free of charge. We have d uh, divisions and websites, Coach Finder, which is a registry they can have. We, we own Coach Radio, help them to have their own radio station. We have coaching support. They can become members of our coaching support groups. These are all free of charge. They can be um, uh, carry on listening to our monthly, uh, weekly webinars and trainings, all free of charge. So we constantly provide ongoing help and support to keep them bolstered up. Oh, that's wonderful. That's good news. Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, but coming back to your personal history, what was the hardest moment in your coaching career and how did you overcome it? Uh, okay, it's probably two, two different hard moments. Um, one was to do with failing and making no money at all. Um, and one was one of my first clients in my first year. I'll talk about that first. I was coaching a client, a um, gentleman, We'd been coaching for a few months. Um, he, he, he wanted to find a direction in life and, and to become more successful in his job. He was employed in a company, um, doing quite well, senior management. Um, and about the sixth or seventh coaching session, he suddenly said, that's it. He said, thank you so much. I've made a decision. I'm leaving my job. I'm going to do something completely different. And I had a little panic attack. I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, what have I done? What have I said? <laughs> um, because I suddenly felt this huge weight of responsibility. What have I done or said that has caused this man? He's a married man with children and a mortgage and, uh, and, and bills to suddenly say, that's it. I'm going to leave my job and do something else. And I suddenly felt a huge responsibility that I had done something really wrong and caused this person to take a disastrous 
turn in their life, you know? Um, and, and, and after that session, I was a bit shaken. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, um, for a day or two, I was quite shaken thinking, my God, my God, what have I done? Um, I, I met, have I ruined this person's life? Yeah. Will he be able to feed his children? What have I? So, but it all turned out fine. And the way I got over that was I sat and I, I did something I, I'm a big fan of. I, I journal. I like to write. Um, I don't write for other people to read, just for, for me, for my own journal. So I started to put my thoughts down. What have I done? How has this come? Have I done something wrong? Could I have done this better? Was, you know, and, and I started to ask myself all these coaching questions and did some internal coaching and came to the conclusion, no, um, what happened was meant to happen. And he had come to a decision that was his decision um, and so on. So that was one panicky moment. Um, another difficult time was um, I'd started coaching and I'd let my other income streams go so that I was focusing on coaching. And I hit a really bad point where I wasn't getting clients, wasn't making money. I have a wife. I have three children. They were they're grown up now, but back then they mm -hmm. were very young. I had to put food on the table and there was no money coming in. Um, and I just was not succeeding. Um, not at the coaching, but at the client acquisition, the getting, getting the new clients. And that sort of wasn't a one day that was over many, many, many weeks. My income started to go down. Da, 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 da. The bills started to go up, up, up. up. Um, so it was a, a rising panic and fear over a period, you know, and and I just got to a point where I, I thought, what well, what am I doing? I, I have to make a change. Maybe I have to leave this coaching and 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 go back to other stuff. Um, and the way I got over that, um, I have a process. I, I like to be by myself a lot. Um, this is why I like motorbiking, you know. Um, what I love, I'll come back to what I love about motorbiking is not just the travel, the adventure, the meeting new people. I love all that. But to me, motorbiking is also two things. It's meditative and elemental. What do I mean? When you're on a motorbike, you feel the elements. You feel the rain. You feel the sun. You're aware of the weather around you much more than you are in a car. You look ahead, you can see a storm, you have to plan around it. You, so you're aware of your surroundings and the elements much more, I, I find anyway. And next, it's meditative. When you're in a car, what do you do? You put the radio on, you put music on. You, you, on a motorbike, at least my bikes, I don't have music or anything. You're left with your own thoughts for hours at a time. And I love that. Um, you know, I, um, I have conversations with myself and uh, running through things in my mind. So it's meditative. You're able to meditate um, on what's happening in your life and around you and discuss the big questions in life with yourself in your own mind. So I like to be on my own at times. So I did, when I hit this panic point, I took myself off for a couple of days. I just went away for it, said to my wife, I, I just need to go for a couple of days. And I spent two days, two and a half days, actually, just basically getting in touch with my vibration. And I know this may sound mm -hmm. weird language and kooky language. Uh, and and no, 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 some all. people listening to this will think I'm just so crazy. But getting in touch with my own vibration, my own frequency, my own thoughts, looking at my goals and asking myself the question, Am I in vibrational balance to my goals? Am I actually a vibrational match to what I want? And I realized the answer was no. In fact, I was a vibrational match to what I don't want. And I was focusing on the negativity. No money, can't pay my mortgage, can't do this, can't do that. All of the negative aspects of not making a, a, a decent living uh, income were in my mind and that's what I was a match to. So I set about changing my 
thoughts from that moment on, changing the self-talk that I talk to myself, like we all self-talk, changing my affirmations, and I'm a big believer in affirmations, so that they were a vibrational match to what I wanted to achieve. And within about three weeks, things started to turn around. Wow. So, yeah. so powerful message. Thank you for sharing. And I'm sure that many coaches, especially new coaches, they can relate to that, to the first story and the second story. And maybe this is something that is missing uh, in those cases of coaching businesses that go down. Maybe that people really have to, to take a couple of days and just to reflect on their goals and on their values. That, that's, yeah. that's really great. Um, Gerard, uh, I watched your webinar on the qualities of leaders a few days ago, and I was really, really impressed. And I was also glad to see that it's on, you, on your YouTube channel already. So I highly recommend to everyone who is listening to this interview now to go to the YouTube the channel of Gerard and to watch this video. And there were many things that actually caught my attention and I wanted to go deeper into them right now. But first, uh, would you give a definition of what is the leadership coaching is and who is a leader in general? Well, you see, that's a, that's a funny word. It's an interesting word. Um, what is a leader? Well, obviously a leader is someone that others follow. So that, that's it. If you go to Amazon, there are over 1000 books on leadership and many of them contradict each other. There are something like 300 different definitions of leader, which tells you that a lot of people don't know what a leader is. But a leader is simply someone that others will follow towards a goal or a vision or a destination. And all great leaders have four things in common. They have a vision. Number two, they are able to communicate that. So vision, communication. Number three, they are worthy of other people's trust. So people trust them to achieve the vision. And number four, the majority are willing to adapt, to learn, and to change direction um, by adjusting, by learning. So they're willing to self-develop, they're willing to learn. So vision, communication, trust, and willingness to learn. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, what caught my attention at your webinar is when you said that um, a true leader will never call himself or herself a leader. And if they do, it means that it's their ego, which is speaking. So does it have anything to do with the humility? And is it essential for a leader to have that? No, no, it's not essential. Um, and we can all think of some leaders who are very um, extrovert and they talk about themselves a lot. Um, but really, leadership there's a difference between what we call a title and a role, you know, a title, leadership isn't a title, a title is chief financial officer, marketing manager, this, that, that's your title. A leadership isn't a title, it's a role you take on. And it's something that other people should call you, you really shouldn't call yourself a leader. That is a function mm -hmm. of the ego. That's a, a function of how you look at yourself, you know. And you see yeah. it on LinkedIn a lot. You see people calling themselves leader. Um, and, and it always amuses me a little bit. If, they do, uh, they do. And, and it's something for, for some reason, everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people want to be a leader. Um, why? I don't know. Um, real leaders don't focus on wanting to be a leader. Real leaders focus on providing either a product or a service, but what is a product or a service? It's something that will give value to someone else. Right. So whether it's a, a mobile phone, whether it's a, a shirt, whether it's a coaching service or an accountant, there, it's something that is of value to someone else. And that's what a true leader focuses on. And yeah. if they focus on it and they're very successful, then they're able to provide that value to more people and more people. And then they'll need people to help them do it. They'll need some administrative backup and some support. And suddenly 
you end up building a small business and then it grows. But very often that was never the plan. Yeah, I totally agree. So the focus should not be on yourself, on not on you being a leader, but on the world around you actually, and Absolutely. on making a difference in the world. Absolutely. If yeah. the focus is on you, the chances are you're never going to build anything of huge value to other people. Yeah, I agree with that. You also mentioned that a leader is someone who is a reader and who is a writer. Yes. What are the two books that made a great impact on you personally? Okay, well, there's so many. Um, you can see around me, I love my books. Yes, yes. You know, <laughs> apart from my family and my, my close friends, these are my greatest friends, my books. And I'm so glad the camera doesn't point down around my desk because I have piles of books on the floor here as well. <laughs> and I haven't yet put out books I have yet to read. Uh, and I am a bookaholic. You know, I'm not an alcoholic, I'm not a chocoholic, but I am <laughs> a bookaholic. I can't help it. I buy two or three every week. Um, so two of the ones that had a great impact on me right at the beginning, uh, they're both classics. One is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Mm -hmm. Such an amazing book by a remarkable man. And the other is Psycho-Cybernetics, Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz. Another mm -hmm. fantastic book. And these books are all about helping you to recondition your mind, your thoughts, mm -hmm. your feelings, your emotions, to focus on taking you where you want to go. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm be sure that uh, I will buy these books and read them <laughs> soon. <laughs> uh, a few more of those blitz questions. Uh, what is your favorite powerful question? Oh, there's so many, isn't there? Coaching, <laughs> what, what is a coach, you know, a definition of a coach? Where, one is a master of the question, a master questionnaire. Exactly. But, but there's one question I do love, which is, how does this serve you? So when I'm, when I'm with a client mm -hmm. and we're talking about them doing something or what, how does this serve you? And it's a powerful question that makes them really go in and think. Yeah, you know? thank you. Your favorite coaching technique? silence the use of silence it's something that people find difficulty using as well oh yes a lot of people like to fill the gap they get uncomfortable if the gap gets long but i find silence is such a powerful tool when you ask a question and then you go Shtum, silent. yeah thank you uh one most important quality of a coach if you had to pick Oh, I yeah, I mentioned this at the beginning. Compassion. Compassion. Very important. The most important lesson coaching taught you? That people are incredible. That people are more creative than you can ever imagine if you give them the right environment in which to grow. This is so true, so powerful. Thank you. Uh, Gerard, coming back to your passion, motorcycle, yes. motorcycling, because I am uh, so much interested in that too. So how these two, how do motorcycling and coaching in your life support each other? Um, good, good question. Um, motorcycling, my wife is very good. Um, she allows me to go away every year on my own for a few weeks on my bike. Um, so thank, you know, I have a wonderful wife and I thank God for that. Um, and I look forward to those times so much when it's a combination of travel, adventure, meeting people, new countries, new horizons, new lands, new food, new cultures, and as well as the adventure, being on my own for two, three, four, five weeks at a time. Um, and I find that is hugely beneficial from a self-development point of view. I find I use those times to think, what have I done? What have I done well? What have I done badly? What should I be doing now? What should I be focusing on? I, so I use the time to think about my life, where I'm going, what I want to focus on. 
uh, it's meditative. Um, and that helps me to apply that to my coaching world, you know? And, and I find the lessons I learn, again, about how wonderful people are, people all over the world are just wonderful. And I've had situations where I had problems broken down and you've had this, you know, in the middle of nowhere and you, you, your bike breaks yeah. and you think, oh God, and now you have a little moment of panic and then you get a grip on yourself and then people just come out of nowhere and help you. For sure. And, and it's wonderful, you know, human nature. Exactly. So, I think that was the main lesson that I learned during my traveling as well. That, that the most of people in the world are just amazing, supportive human beings. It's, they are. Yeah. In wonderful. every country, in every culture. And what I, you may have found this, the people who have the least give the most. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but unfortunately, the last year and actually this year is not the best moment for traveling. And I find it really, really difficult for myself and I'm sure for you as well. How are you coping with that? With difficulty, you know. I go out <laughs> to my garage every day and I stroke my bike. <laughs> <laughs> you missing me. Um, and I'm, I plan. Uh, last year, I, I like you, I had plans. I was going to Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan and that didn't happen. Um, Maybe this year it will, but you just have to keep your hopes up. And you know, there is sometimes as much excitement and joy in the planning as there is sure. in the going. So I'm using this time to plan. Where would I like to go? When would I like to go? What would I like to experience when, when the time comes? Definitely. Almost every day I'm spending time with my map and I'm planning the next destinations. And <laughs> exactly. That definitely helps in this situation. Gerard, I have so many questions and I think that I have I can spend hours talking to you, but unfortunately the time is running. I still have a few questions to you, if I may. Sure. Um, for anyone who wants to, to be a student of Noble Manhattan and to get the diploma of a practitioner of the coach, uh, what should they do? Well, the first thing to do is anyone, they should do their due diligence. Don't just look at us. Look at the top three, four, five coach training companies. Look at them all. Investigate what they do. And they're all good, by the way. The top half a dozen are all great companies. Um, yeah. Look at what they do. They all do it in a slightly different way. They all have their own unique approach. And pick the company that you feel resonates with your heart. Okay. Because it's a long-term relationship. Training to be a coach takes many months and then it's ongoing. You'll be connected to that company for forever. So pick one that you love and that resonates with you. Okay. From my personal experience, I can say that Normal Manhattan is a wonderful company and I can definitely recommend it. So okay. if someone is looking for, uh, for the proper company, so my number one choice would be Noble Manhattan. So, but how to, um, how to reach out to Noble Manhattan, how okay. to apply? I either go to our website or email. The email would be info at noble-manhattan.com, info at noble-manhattan.com, mm -hmm. or go to our website, which is noble-manhattan.com, and go to one of the inquiry forms. And just take your time, take your time. <laughs> Wonderful. And just today, the news got through that you won a very, very special reward, the CEO of the year. Can you tell more about it and how do you feel about it? And well, first of all, congratulations, really well deserved. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. By the yeah, CEO Corporation did that. Um, yes, it came out of the blue. I wasn't expecting it. It came through yesterday. And it's lovely to get these. Um, but it's important not to let these things go to your head, you know. Um, it's nice but it's back to work. So, you know, Emerson said, do the thing and you shall have power. So you get power in life by doing the thing that you love to do. Definitely. So my last question, what are your goals for this year, 2021? Well, we have big goals. Um, we would like to, at the moment we are trading in about 25 countries. We have just opened up in Kenya. It was an office in Nairobi. And over the next 10 to 12 months, I would very much like to 
uh, open up in at least two other countries and then two the next year. Uh, we do it by working with franchise partners. So I would love to find uh, franchise partners in a couple of countries and, and bond with them and, and look at how we can support them in their country. So that's my aim. Wow, that's wonderful. I'm wishing you all the best and I'm sure that you will definitely succeed in your goals and you will achieve everything that you set up for, for this year. Thank you so much, Gerard, for sharing your experience and for these insightful things. That was really, really helpful and interesting. Thank you so Bless much. You. Thank you and thank you for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Gerard.